Uh, oh, cutting in. All right. Once again, I'd like to uh, welcome us to tonight's board meeting of the Burnhouse Boston Lake Board of Education. Uh, as is our custom, I would go ahead and start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I want to apologize for a a little bit of a late start. We had a great uh, dinner with our CSEA uh, leadership tonight, and then uh, some of our board, our board members are also parents here, and so we had a big volleyball match that just ended, so uh, we won. That's the important part. Um, so, uh, tonight's a very special night because we're going to get a chance to learn about the elementary program, what's been happening in the last year, some great results there. Uh, we typically uh, start with some introductions, so why don't we go ahead and... Patrick McGrath. Jennifer Longton. Lisa Morse. Mary Ellen Seimer. Noah Van Ostrowitz. Daddy Salvatore. Rick Evans. Joel Bonaccio. Tim Sinenberg. Sharon. Sharon McTighe. Kate Gurley. Uh, Carrie Sanchez. Dave Collins. Bill McQuay. Suzanne Rail. Christopher Abdu. Dave Versaki. Don Marshall. Peter Sawyer. Andrew Wildrick. All right, and John Blowers. So, um, <laughs> so I think we typically start with consent agenda. Uh, so do we have a motion, please? So moved. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, and so we're looking at the uh, minutes of our uh, most recent meeting and also, also the authorization of a textbook. Uh, any discussion or questions on that one? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. I see a lot of our uh, brain trust here, so I don't know if we have privilege of the floor or if we're just, uh, I think we're clear on that. Okay, we'll dispense with privilege of the floor. Um, we're right into our uh, program review, and I think Mrs. Simon's going to kick us off. So tonight is our elementary program review, and we have our three distinguished elementary principals, uh, Dr. Evans, Mrs. Bonaccio, Mr. Sinnenberg, along with our K-12 supervisors that worked over the last probably, I'd say, four weeks, um, putting the presentation together, but are constantly looking at um, student results and things going on in their buildings, and tonight they're here to share with you uh, in the same format, a narrative format with a SWOT analysis, our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and our threats, as well as a report out on our student <coughs> achievement from the last year. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Ben. Okay. Sure. We're going to start off with our what we do well, and what we'd like to start off with is um, our holistic approach, the approach we take with our students, although we may take it a little differently in each building as far as our programming. But our priority is um, for, in our elementary schools, is to make connections, make sure our students are make, making connections, make sure that they're engaged in our learning communities through um, different activities, clubs, um, things that we do throughout the, the day uh, to connect with them. So as far as that goes, we have, uh, I have sweethearts and heroes at Pashley. A sweetheart is what we call a carrier of hope. Uh, and a hero is we've been teaching the children along with staff development, along with parents coming and at night with sweet, the Sweethearts and Heroes team, um, how to show empathy, how to model empathy, how to have a listening ear, how to stand up to, to bullying, which has been really a two-year training and process. And at first when we did our bullying drills, it was a little bit awkward for our older students. It was a little bit awkward for us, but now it, it's so much more natural and um, we live it every day and we, we have monthly themes. We had, at the end of the year, we had a breakfast of hope. So we're continuing that with our committee and the, the children, the staff, our parents have really bought into it. It's really important and just adds to the positive culture that we work so hard to achieve in all three of our buildings. And their concepts are the same philosophy, but they're a little bit different. Yeah. So at Charlton Heights, we do kindness and we, we have the kids really focus in on what it means to be kind to others and how that affects everyone. And we have kindness ambassadors, they're student ambassadors who go throughout the building uh, spreading the word and making sure that all of the students know what those components are and how it looks and feels and sounds to be kind to others. And we have a kindness club with over 120 members, kindergarten through fifth grade. And it culminates in a huge kindness week where our kindness ambassadors lead us through events every, every day throughout the week. And at the end, we've got a huge assembly. And uh, last year, we basically did a conga line where we were all basically hand to shoulder around the entire building. 
So what? <laughs> All right, um, it's Stevens School. Um, we have, we've been focusing on our Thriving School initiative for the past, this is our sixth year now. And it's something that we've just tried to um, delve deeper each year and it has to do with the, the elements of, of well-being, um, positive emotions, um, helping students build those positive emotions in their, and, the, and the adults, incidentally, um, such as gratitude, such as um, kindness, joy, just the different things that feel good. En engagement is the second part that we really try to build into our, into our program, and that has to do with um, using our strengths and pushing ourselves and challenging ourselves, that the concept of flow, for instance, um, and being in the zone, and we try to implement that at, at an elementary level with our kids. Um, relationships, as Jill had mentioned, is about the connections, and that's another element of well-being. So that's the P-E-R, and then the M is a sense of meaning, and that we, you know, that's through our, the work that we do, the charitable work that our school does, um, in different sources of meaning that we have. And the last piece is a sense of accomplishment, the A. Um, and that is our, through goal setting, um, accomplishing goals, um, celebrating the, the grit and the determination and the growth mindset it takes to achieve our goals. And so we've been, again, we've been um, doing this for the past six years now, and so we're, we're really going deeper. It's, it's further entrenched in our kids, and we're, we're really excited about it. And so um, we added another element this past year, and that's the V, the vitality part. We perma be just because we felt like in order to give us the energy to do that the PERMA we need to get proper sleep we need to meditate we need to have proper nutrition that's why we try to start we have our smoothie Fridays and our um, salad days and just trying to just promote those elements of a uh, that give us that vitality in life so um, that's the work that we're doing at Stevens and as you can tell they all have their different flavor to them but ultimately it comes down to help helping kids to feel you know, connected and engaged with their school. As, as, you, as these programs become more mature, we get some history on it. Are we, are we sensing like it's supposed to get into middle school where you know, bullying gets more kind of theme or something? Are we seeing you know, some, some longitudinal effects of that? Are we aware of seeds you're planting there carry through so there's less activity like that possibly? Or we know That's the, the next answer? program review. Oh, middle yeah, school. That's the goal. But John, but I can't say it. In, um, Stay tuned. Yeah, and speaking to Colleen, um, her the students that have been in our schools are coming up with the language, with the vocabulary, mm -hmm. with the understanding of our of our respective schools. And that's like and they're, a, a, a really staff led initiative for character development, character ed in the middle school. Yeah. Um, they actually had a half day uh, on the morning when we when the kids were released for half day, the, the whole first half of the day, all the teams. Spent time on character development, on, on just you know doing some uh, personality exercises to figure out who they are, their strengths, weaknesses, and then spent. So Mary Ellen and I had a chance to walk around to a bunch of the different activities. They just focused that half day on. It. So it's it is feeding. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, sure I'm on a PTA we're at the, 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 you know the same. The culture has really uh, been carried into the middle school and and with the help of the great. administration. Tell Jill the ripple is coming out about sweethearts and heroes because a teacher yeah, at uh, Boston Spot asked me who was also a board member at Stillwater about Sweethearts and Harris, and I told her what a big success it was. So it's been I think great. Gonna actually, that. Colleen Wolf was right. she who, who brought it to me. And I'm gonna, I'm, we're still in that this year in our school. Mm -hmm. I, I want to bring Sweethearts and Harris to our school to inform the work that we're doing. So, um, absolutely. Now I'd ask uh, Mary Ellen to uh, send some questions out in terms of you know, being able to assess what you're doing, because I think it's really important work. Um, and she mentioned that, the, that they have a state assessment for climate. How, have you guys got a chance to look at that? And how does that fit in with what you're doing? We haven't because it was a small pilot last year in the state. Oh, okay. And they're expanding the pilot this year. And my understanding is it's going to be implemented in 2020 as something that all schools are going to have to do. Mm -hmm. ESSA is taking measurements of culture and climate in different buildings. Okay. So, Did, but we haven't seen that at all? No. Yeah. We have, we do have a survey um, I remember, yeah, yeah. that um, we've utilized, and, I think, and Tim and Jill have utilized also. T Tim's used it, and Jill's looking at it. So it's a lot of um, sharing. If we're not doing it at our school, I, like I know Tim, for instance, he does. They, they do amazing things of including giving their kids experiences um, with theater. We haven't done that as much. I'm not a theatrical guy. I wouldn't be the guy to lead that. You but, are. But our kids, yeah. <laughs> we are hilarious. Basketball-wise, you dominate. We've got game over at Stevens. But no, so it's a lot of sharing that we're, we've been doing, um, even more in recent years. Yeah. One of the things with the, 
if we have the opportunity to sign up for the pilot, uh, uh, to pilot the, the, uh, cult, the culture and climate survey, um, the people at BOCES, uh, the district superintendent was encouraging us the other day to really do it because it's going to become a required no thing that you're scored on and reported on, and so it would be good to kind of get a baseline. Uh, so if we have that opportunity to, to pilot it, we will this year. So I want, I want you guys to have more feedback into it because you're already doing great things. You don't want to, you know, have to. Great. We would welcome the feedback. And so to go along with the SWOT analysis, our strengths, we think, at Burnt Hills are a collaborative atmosphere. And what we're presenting on, we're just uh, three people presenting on a wonderful elementary program. But it comes from great kids, uh, wonderful staff, and that includes the administrators who are supporting colleagues. us behind us. And so what we wanted to do this year is show all of the work that they do, our administrators K to 12, to really make us what we are. And so what I've done is I will highlight one area from each of those, and you've seen the, the full report, so you can ask questions as we go along if you've got you know, a question about those specific areas. Uh, for language arts, We've been focusing on proficiency levels, and the teachers have been hard at work on generating specific district skills that they want each student to achieve kindergarten through fifth grade. They've been put together in binders, and it's a very complete scope and sequence. Um, for math, science, social studies, each of those subject areas are taking a look at the new standards. In mathematics, we've got the new generation math standards, and the math committee has done a really nice job of taking a look at them, doing a crosswalk, figuring out where we are, where we need to go, and putting together um, a, a survey on you know what we need to do a little bit better and um, give, give a snapshot of the changes that are coming up. Uh, science and technology, we have a framework, and it's K-5 to content, and they put together a nice curriculum map. In social studies, they are having teachers pilot different, um, different units that go along with the new standards. Health, we have, again, new binders that go along with the new New York State standards. And we have mental health lessons that we're, we're putting into those. And we're finding that some grade levels had some specific areas where we were covering some of the content, but we definitely need, needed to revise some of the, some of the um, lessons that we do and add some lessons on that as well. In special ed, we have had some great work with two new administrators who have really helped Sharon and the entire team take a look at each of the three individual buildings and try to make sure that there is a consistent continuum of services, that a child who's at Charlton Heights will receive the same type of services at Pashley and at Stevens, that the same criteria are utilized, that when we're recommending services in one building, it's the same type of service that will be utilized in the other buildings as well. Tim, can I, can I ask you in terms of that, you know, to, to some extent, some, you know, we know these services are, are going to be expensive, but I'm wondering to some extent, are there some services where you might want to specialize so that you know, if a kid has a particular problem, they can, you know, do you have some differentiation there? We do. We, we have some specialty programs in each of the buildings, okay. but each of us has some similar programs as well. So we want to make sure in those similar programs that we're um, doing the best for the kids in a consistent manner. Anything further? No, I would agree. And the other nice thing is, even though we do have some specialty programs, we've been doing a lot of sharing some of the things that work, some of the things that don't work. Because just because someone's in a program or not doesn't mean that there's other students in the other buildings who might be struggling with some of those same types of behaviors, some academic issues. So we do like to share things that are working. Uh, physical education, they've been doing a, a lot of really great activities. We have Spartan fitness challenges. We've got a lot of morning activities, running programs, walking programs. Um, you heard Rick mention about the, the smoothies, um, yoga. So a, a lot of really fun things going on in physical education. And RTI, we 
basically because of some of the direction from the Board of Education and Central Administration, we're not using the New York State ELA and math test to qualify for RTI. So we've tried to look at some different ways of getting information on the kids. And one of them was EZCBM, and it's a nationally normed assessment. And we found that it was useful in helping identify students for RTI. Fine arts, one thing that they have been working on is trying to get one primary art teacher and music teacher in each of the elementary schools. Um, music has been very consistent where we've had one teacher. Art has been something where I've had one and a half or, or I've had 0.8 and Jill has had the same teacher for 0.2 and we each had two or three art teachers. So this year it, it's much more consistent um, and that's been really nice and we thank Peter Giroux for that. Tim, in that uh, RTI stuff there with that easy CBM, are you finding that 5%, 20%? What, what, what was our ratio of kids that you know, needed need their support? So what's the ratio? I didn't hear the last part of your question. What was the ratio yeah, of students that need the extra help or need that RTI? From 10 to 20 percent for um, math and reading it depends on the grade level. Um, the if we in reading it goes down. It, 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 we have more in primary, and and then because they receive that that intervention, we get fewer kids in the intermediate. In math, we start at more kids in third grade. That's where we start the um, AIS, and then we it, it declines when they get to fifth grade. Um, not when the kids get to fifth grade, but when you look at the third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade numbers, you see a, a decline in the numbers. And, and do we have to wait till a state test of third grade or some kind of uh, equivalent, or is there a way to assess some of this in kindergarten through second to start the I part earlier? So for math or for reading? Both, I guess. So um, yes, so math we don't have, I mean, we have some information based on what the teacher's doing every day in their class with the uh, chapter test that they give, okay. and Bill can talk more about that. But we start really looking at um, where their progress is in third grade, because that's when we begin to uh, do, um, provide services. In reading, we start K uh, and work our way up. So we just look at we look at different things in kindergarten than we do at first and second and third, um, and fourth and fifth. But yes, we get so we have some good information. We, you know, that was, what will make someone successful in third grade? Can we back that up? And then some of these conversations that, that Marilyn and others are having with even preschool to say, okay, well, if somebody mm -hmm. comes into kindergarten at this, you know minimum proficiency, then we could probably carry that trajectory and then, right. you know, have, have them you know, predict success potentially in third grade or identify where someone's getting off track. And when we started that conversation, because we were worried about the number of qualifiers we had in kindergarten at um, last year in some of the elementary schools. So we, uh, you know, we brainstormed as a group that, you know, with the principals and the RTI um, specialists and Mary Ellen and Patrick and, you know, how can we, what are some things we can do? So. I met with kindergarten teachers and we and uh, come up with some I, some things that we were looking for from um, the nursery schools to kind of say you know this, this would be you know if the kids if, if the nursery schools could work on some of these these things then we would see um, they might um, not be ne needing as many very, services when they came to kindergarten. I mean I think as a non because I'm not an ELA person or a reading person by trade but when you sit down and look at the skills that are being assessed it's, they're not subjective their you know sounds and letter recognition and things that kids are not coming in with and right. and there's just it's either a yes or no when you look at these different measures right. four different measures that the kindergartens are kindergartners are screened on across the district so yeah. when we see these larger numbers in certain areas larger numbers it's something that there is a way to target you know it's the next question becomes how do we target the preschool programs or right. even know if kids are in preschool or are they being right. getting opportunities right. to have those programs or a summer transitional program, or, you know, prep for good or something, I don't know. Right. And I have to back up a little bit on the math and the, and the primary grades. We don't have the um, capacity and staffing to offer services outside of what kids might be getting in the classroom. That's been an alternate budget proposal for the last few years to add an elementary math yeah. specialist. At least 10 years. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's an, that's an area of need that we'll talk about later, too. Because okay. we've, we've done, we've made some investment, at least on the, on the ELA side, and yes. seen some good results. Yes. Yeah. But what we, I know we've, you know, we've talked about this before too, but if, you know, if this, maybe this is the year we get it across the goal line with it, that if we've had that success on the ELA side, why would we not want to have that success on the mass? I can just give you one example, John. Um, I had a committee meeting today, one of my committee members from Pashley is a kindergarten teacher, and she was describing one of her students that she has that doesn't even have one-to-one -one correspondence, like can count to five, but can't 
if there's five coins on the table, can't point to one and say one, two, three, four, five. Okay. I mean, it's some of them are coming in really low. You know, I right. don't know if it's parent involvement, no parent involvement, you know, like reading, reading books, you know, math books, but some of the kids are coming in pretty well. Yeah, I mean, unless and until we're going to commit to a universal pre-K, which is probably not on the immediate rise, and we've got to come up with something in the interim, right? So, yeah, it's good. It's helpful. I think the tricky thing is every year it's something that we definitely value. But when the board gives us the budget that we're working and utilizing with, and you're you're looking at class sizes, you're looking at areas that you need to cut, and it doesn't quite make it. It's like right there. We all want to do it, but just with budget constraints, it, it's something that we haven't been able to do. So maybe this will be the year. And John, your point is that, and I said this last year that the. If it, the work that we're seeing in ELA, there's lots of research that shows that that same work that you do when you, if you, if you address the, the needs in kindergarten, you have fewer kids in first grade, and, and we, you know, we do that in ELA. They say the same thing is for math. So if we if we're able to address those the, the kids who don't have that number sense and, and build that number sense, then at the primary grades, then you'll see fewer kids qualify in the intermediate grades. Yeah, I hate to turn you know education into business, but so I know it really too. And, and, and if we you know make that. Nominal investment early on is a workforce utilization play later, right? So there's going to be a business case yeah, in there somewhere. Yeah. Right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. And we have each of the elementary schools, for some reason or another, our kindergarten classes are a little bit needier than we've seen in prior years. And I'm not sure what the reason is, but it, it's just a group that needs a little bit more assistance. So that's what we're doing. We're you know, all doing our very best to make sure that they've got the, the needed skills. It's a universal phenomenon. Have you noticed that in all the, most of the kindergarten? All three. It's, it's, new, new, it's a recent phenomenon, it sounds like. It's yeah, it, it's not like the first graders were like that. Just this incoming group of kindergartners. Anecdotally, I could say the same, anecdotally, we, I could say the same for, sorry. Yeah, we, okay. Carrie, Sakas, so, and I have been looking at the data for the past five years. I know, Marilyn, you have two. And there is an increase in terms of students who are not afforded the opportunity to attempt preschool because there's financial constraints. Well, because when you, I mean, you guys mentioned about you know, the, the, the social, emotional issues and so on, and, you know, you can listen to my 10 minute rant about the changing demographics in this community about, you know, the higher poverty and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a changing community. I mean, we, maybe we don't all experience it on a daily basis, but it's real. And so, you know, whether that wants us to think differently about, you know, if we've got a summer program for current students, do we have a, a get ready for kindergarten program? I don't we know. do. Oh, we do. We do, but it's very <laughs> small. Okay. Well, the other piece is very there's, small. And there's no transportation. That's so the kids have to, have to provide the transportation, so then they don't. It's for 20 yeah, of the kids who we feel so could need it the most. We could probably offer it tomorrow. 20 is the most. 20 but it, but it then. Right. Then, but then those that it's offered to often will say, I right. can't get them there. Right. Right. And the other thing is we did tick up on our class sizes this year in kindergarten as well, compared to what we had last year. And our, and our kindergartners, uh, I mean, sorry, too radical here, our kindergartners candidates to do this virtual and then learn from their homes. <laughs> I think if they were able to do that, we might be seeing a different. Maybe with parents, I mean, I'm not saying she's not saying I'm not. Well, I, I think that one thing is that this, we've had a couple meetings in the last couple of weeks just as we looked at the result, as we've looked at the results, getting ready for this presentation and just kind of looking at the year. And this theme is coming up, so it really, it's sort of unfolding right now that right. maybe preschool is an area we want to focus on this year, making connections with our preschool teachers, looking at opportunities to see what are there ways that we can provide resources to them. You know, and look at maybe for next summer okay. things. You know, expanding what we do. Yeah, I mean, if a generation of kids have grown up on Baby Einstein, maybe they can, you know, you know, actually have a, a real person under this you know, thing. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think I'd look more to partner with some of our community agencies. Like I know that, you know, Captain does um, quite a bit in Clifton Park areas, and okay. maybe it's time to reach out and try to partner with some community agencies. Yeah. Some of our, our um, you know, our. our uh, clergy, the Council of Clergy, and reach out and work with community partners, bring in Rotary, um, maybe offer some some unique and different opportunities for um, preschoolers maybe prior to in the summer. You know, get like kind of the get out of the box a little bit. I like it. Are you kind of do an assessment of the needs and then maybe even try to develop some of your program where we're using our students 
who were in high school mm. to work with kids. Because you know, what a great way for people thinking about going into that. And then maybe getting some people from some of these organizations who volunteer the time to help supervise that or you know, getting a grant just to try to test out what we could do, taking advantage of the resources that we have within the community. Mm -hmm. I, did try, I, I did speak to SUNY Albany and St. Rose to try to get an intern to help with our, uh, we had some big numbers in RTI at, at one of the schools. So I did reach out and see if we could, um, they had any, but they, we, we, they did not have anybody that was available to work with us. So that we can maybe reach out sooner. So we'll we'll send, send me the information Great. and I'll go out because I know some folks in both Great. schools. So I'll see That's great. I can, and, I, I've just, and I started the conversation with two of the, um, I know you wrote that, Marilyn, of two of the nursery schools. And it was a very productive, great conversation. But um, they're, they're already doing, they already have regular con contact with our kindergarten teachers that, you know, um, and they meet with the kindergarten teachers. They've subbed in our buildings before they took the nursery school position. So they, the ones that I was speaking to are the ones, you know, they are already connected. They're the ones that we knew were yes. doing a great job. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, that's the next step. Something yeah. I want to bring up, though, is those who go to nursery school are not socioeconomically challenged to get their kids there. The ones that I think <clears throat> perhaps may be impacted are the ones Correct. that are not in the exactly. because of those issues. Right. Do we know so that would be the population we'd have to connect with. Right. Those who aren't attending. Right. Yep. Just preschool. do we know roughly how many of our incoming kindergartners didn't have didn't, didn't attend preschool? I mean, roughly. I don't have. I mean, you can get that. No, the we, percentage we, percentage we, that. we did record it though. Jackie, yes. that, that may not be the only to get. I'm just asking. Yeah, no, no, it's good that we do. We should have that data point. Jackie gets all that information, and also sometimes it's actually it's preschool, and sometimes it's daycare. So there's differences right sure. in there, sure. and maybe there's a whole area daycare providers where the kids are going someplace structured, but they may not necessarily have the materials. Maybe we look at ways to get materials in the hands of daycare right. providers to provide just some basics, the kinds of things that are looked at yeah. in the screenings, you know. I'd be happy to help with So what we do is we actually do um, incoming kindergartners when we do that whole kindergarten roundup and things. Um, we administer what's called the dial, um, and it assess basically three components of the kids. It assess, as Patrick talked about, the verbal piece. Can they recognize letters? Can they recognize numbers? Kind of their basic knowledge. Then we have the speech um, pathologists go through um, articulation pieces. They have them um, do different words, rhyming, things like that. And then we have um, the OTPT do um, jumping, skipping, catching. Um, do they catch two hands? Do they trap the ball? Um, cutting. Um, so we try to get kind of a big picture of that. In addition, we have we collect where they went to nursery school, if they attended. We collect data um, from the parents, which can or cannot be subjective, definitely, but about behaviors at home, independence on um, putting shoes on, a coat on, getting dressed, being told simple step directions. So we try and compile all of this. Um, it's what we use, Mary Ellen um, Ann Long, the summer school principal, and I meet and look at the kids that would be in need of jumpstart, so our summer opportunity. But we only have about 20 seats in that, so obviously, we usually, honestly, we usually send out between like 40 and 45 letters, and about 20 take the opportunity. So we do look at the kids um, kind of as much as we can for incoming students. Um, Jill mentioned that we're looking back on you know, is there a correlation between attending nursery school? Is there a correlation between what kind of program you're being introduced to in nursery school? Is there a correlation even between um, your age? You know, we have kids that are very close to pushing that six-year-old in kindergarten, and then we have the kiddos that are, are very young in there. So you have a, a pretty wide range. And, you know, is that then home experience in there as well? So. It will, you know, Peter, I'm thinking kind of with your hat on too, like we can look at some of the data, but whether or not parents are providing the experiences that then are kind of that toolbox for kids to go to school right. is also gonna impact. You know, I can look at the chart and say, well, I have a young kid who didn't go to nursery school, but his skills are off the chart. So that could be kind of the anomaly to the, the, the piece of the puzzle. You know, we're in a, a a person-based business, so there's not always a right answer. Um, but Jill and I are starting to look at, you know, is there a, even just a trend in some of these areas that maybe we can target 
and be a little more proactive with them. Yeah, because I'm just trying to see where the holes are, you know, what the needs are, and then we can identify, figure out a way to get the programs and the supports that we need to put in place. And if we have to go to outside grants on a temporary basis, we do that so we can build a program that we can replicate within the budget cycle. And then the other thing is, too, is like that gets shared with OTPT, that gets shared with speech, that gets shared with the kindergarten teachers. So it gives them kind of a baseline when the kids walk in the door even, that they know this child didn't know any of their letters identification, didn't know the numbers, didn't know even how to cut. So, you know, they have kind of a baseline of things to start to already differentiate from the minute the kids get off the bus day one. And we also, we also have, have a professional meeting with the parents right after that screening, and we go over strengths and weaknesses, and we give them suggestions on what they can do to help their child in the next couple months before they do enter kindergarten. But I imagine, too, that you've got situations where the home environment is not conducive to the school environment, so how do we, how do you, how do you address that, you know, you know, through this process? Because, you, you know, you, now this is great at an early age, but I also wonder if you identified homes as another way to, to address the, those situations, too. When, you know, it's got to be tough. It, probably a good time to note you've mentioned grants a couple of times. Yeah. We, we did lose Title I funding mm -hmm. this year. Um, Significant amounts. How much? About one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, because the number of our students in poverty dropped below five percent. So we're actually showing it's an, not to get off too far off topic, but it's an interesting kind of dichotomy we're seeing. Statistically speaking, the federal government is showing our poverty percentage decreasing. Yet you're hearing from the principals that our need yeah. may be increasing in kindergarten. So it's it's interesting. Right. Is that how current is that? Is that lagging or is that? I don't think it's it's the exact year. It may be lagged a year or two. I don't think it's lagged terribly. They don't use the federal census data anymore to determine that. They have like a small area. I forgot exactly what the acronym is, but they look at it uh, basically on a smaller scale, more locally on a year-to-year -year basis. It's not. It might not be current as of the date. It might not be in September, maybe one year ago, but it's no longer 10 years ago. It may be a year or two behind. So we've got a preview of some of our challenges. Yes. Yes. Um, I've got a couple more strengths to share. All right. Um, <laughs> Let's go to the strengths. Let's feel good. <laughs> I have five more questions. Right. <laughs> exactly. In library, we're really proud of the summer reading challenge. And this year, we had about 50% of the kids participate in the summer reading challenge. And each of the elementary schools had their top 10 have signs outside their yards. So that was exciting. In world language, we were very pleased to offer after-school language opportunities, first grade through fifth grade in French, Chinese, German, and Spanish. And our building RTI teams have been working together really nicely on talking and discussing each child who comes up for review and making sure that we're offering great alternatives and strategies that we can implement to help the kids do their very best. And we're also proud that our RTI teams work directly with the parents so that what we're doing in school, they can utilize at home and we can be working with the kids in a, a really connected way that is targeted and specialized. Is this, um, is this team being stretched? We typically have to stop uh, talking about new students in about March just because it involves a, a lot of data collection and um, before strategies are implemented, and then we collect data at least six to eight weeks while we're targeting the um, either behaviors or the academics, and then we need time at the end to, uh, to discuss what's working, what's not, to revise those plans. And we, we find that after March, we don't have the time to go through that process as well. So, and, and there is, a lot of people who we, a lot of students who we do need to discuss, but um, we want to make sure that we give each of the kids what they, what they need. Okay. And at times we'll we'll have a, a smaller group to get get together if the you know it does get stretched a little bit in terms of our teams, so that is effective as well, so that we're addressing all the needs. So some, sometimes it's just multiple meetings. We used to meet once a week, and nice. so now we meet once a week on the new students. And then the review sessions, we might break off into smaller groups, and we have multiple meetings going on. So there could be four or five RTI meetings within a week. Oh, okay. 
And I think if all of us are in like constant daily, if not a hourly contact with our social workers and our psychologists, wouldn't you agree? So those are some of our strengths. All right. Uh, some of the program challenges we've already discussed um, in relation to staffing and programming related to academics or emotional or behavioral needs. We're still seeing the mental health needs increase in terms of you know the anxiety piece with some of our students. Uh, Tim had uh, earlier mentioned that we do work really closely together. Actually, we started the SOAR program what three years ago, so we we're having some just some different bumps. So I, we work closely with Tim and his team, and now we're we're modeling what his team is doing as far as grade levels and case le levels being more manageable and it, it's working out very, very well this year. So that has been helpful and Sharon and Kathy Burns have helped out with, with that as well. So we are getting creative and working together to try to um, come up with some of the solutions in regards to those needs as well. We did discuss the early in intervention map. I know this is something that we, we have discussed and that we put proposals in in regards to um, Peter, your question, you know, Kate touched on a little bit, but we do see the students who are receiving intervention in third, you'll see a decrease in fourth and fifth, just like with the RTI K-5. Um, I'll speak with Pash to Pashley, uh, K-1 tends to be a bit heavier, and then you see a pretty significant decrease, a drop. Um, so it's working, which, it, which is great. So, you know, it's great that we're starting the primary grade level, and I think we would all be in agreement that that really need to be doing that with so math as well. So we see the math RTI is sort of like just a bridge money to, to get the thing off the ground and then you're going to see the results later because cost neutral and absorb it back in or is this, a, is this an incremental ad for ever more into a budget if we were to go with the math RTI forever? I have to say probably, it probably, probably, a, probably a forever for thing I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we just have new students but the students with put through RTI if they would have less issues so they'd be Shifting of less, resources, right? You're shifting, shifting downward, right? Yes. That's what you're you're thinking, you're after thinking after initial kick after, after yeah. a certain number of folks get to a certain point in the process. So I think like three years into the into the math RTI investment, you start to see a trade off. Yeah. 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 You see less and more and more and more. Have we seen it with the ELA? That's what yes. I think I just heard. So yeah. it has there are less yeah. services at the secondary. I mean, has it result, resulted in it being well, I'm saying the numbers are, 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 there's a decrease, three, four, five, you'll see that. I'm not saying in the middle school. When there's a decrease in the number, in answer to Chris's yes. question yes. in full disclosure, yes. there's a decrease in the numbers, there's not a decrease in the staffing. Well, that's not my question, that's John's question. Right. Just clarifying. Because well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the staffing is utilized. Our, our RTI program is set up so that in kindergarten, first, first and second grade, they, they get very targeted instruction four or five times a week, and the numbers are smaller. As they get into third, fourth, and fifth, um, the numbers get a little bit bigger. Some of the group sizes are bigger. And um, it's not the quite as individualized as what we do in, in those earlier grades. But the overall number of needs decreases. Mm -hmm. You can yes. see we think because of that. when you look at the chart. When we, when we put right. that down on, on, on uh, ELA RTI, and then we went up in Buffalo and talked to some school districts that are further along the continuum. You may remember this, and, and you know we thought, oh, pretty, when are we going to see this pot of gold on staffing? And then the answer was, you don't. And so that's why I wanted to kind of confirm it's the same on the math side of the house. However, in terms of the pot of gold, one of the one of the um, tenets of you know the reasons for bringing forward uh, RTI was the high number of students, even in suburban schools, identified as special education. Need, needing special education services in the area of literacy and numeracy. And so um, in that way, you know, we are serving kids who may otherwise, because of the more intensive support, may offset our costs in, yeah. in the special education realm uh, as well. I was going to jump in with that same point that, you know, in terms of the long-term costs versus benefits of early intervention, um, as students, con as the gap continues to grow um, in their math skills or their literacy skills, it's that much more difficult to make up that ground if you're starting later, so that gap has grown. And then we start having conversations about is this a dis disability versus a, an area where, you know, remediation can kick in. So I would vote for, I would, you know, just to reiterate, the earlier we can intervene, Early and often, the less likelihood of that gap growing and then it turning into. Um, and you it's know, probably hard to tell, but to, to quantify something like that, or you know, our our arc on spending on. Mm -hmm. Don't hold your own. 
you know, sure. it, it goes like this, right? And so and the, the percentage of folks that, that participate is about 15, 16% of our students, mm -hmm. so some kind of an IEP or something of that nature, maybe. Yeah, well, if we include 504, sure. And so with, with you know, whatever we're at, eight or, eight or nine years, seven or eight, maybe it is, however many on, on, our, on ELA, RTI, uh, are we seeing that, you know, that trend change? Is that, are we, are we bending that curve a little bit? Yes, I can tell you that over the years, I mean, there's there's bubbles, and mm -hmm. I think we're experiencing one right now, um, because that the is. needy incoming K group, and we had a large mm -hmm. influx of students with disabilities transfer into the district this year. We have that every year. Yep. This year, I will say more than we have felt in a long time, um, those transfer numbers are up, and the level of need is way up. Students coming in needing self-contained programming right away versus you know say resource or one. So that over history, that, that. Yeah. But for the most part, right? Long term, we have um, we've definitely seen a reduction in referrals to the committee on special education, yeah. and when those referrals are made, we see more of a higher percentage of those referrals result in being identified, where before you might see on board. CSE sheets, a lot of ineligible. You still see some of those, but years ago you used to see a lot more of that, and it's because there are a lot of um, we're suspect of disabilities uh, a lot earlier and more often without the implementation of RTI. So it's really so weeding out those there. students who yeah. didn't respond to those interventions where we're really looking at a disability. I've actually seen less students go through the RTI process who need academic support more of the students need behavior support. And so a lot of the times when we're looking at a student who has academic needs, we'll say, RTI is working. We don't need to go for specialized, uh, an IEP for this student. That's ELA it's RTI. really working, ELA RTI. We get students who might need some mathematics, so that's a, another question. And sometimes they're in first grade, so we think, what can we do as a Band-Aid in second grade till they get to third grade and can get that AIS support for mathematics. But we do see, I, I have seen a lot of assistance necessary for the behaviors. Yeah. And so what we try to do at Charlton Heights is whenever possible, we try to utilize those same services to provide RTI behavioral support. So we have our social worker, we have our occupational therapist, physical therapist, whenever we can doing groups with the kindergartens, first grades, teaching them the skills. I know that they do it in the other buildings as well, just to provide some of those, like the packs, so that the kids get those behavioral interventions early. So we're, we're trying, it's just with some of the other needs that we have, you can't always go in that direction, but we try the best we can with the you staff. Some of the behaviors related to the, the academic piece, where say, um, yeah, reading can be very frustrating. frustrating. And if you're not getting the support to be able to to be able to read, and then that's frustrating, and maybe it, the behavior is different. Is there, I, I think, think sometimes. I, I think there are many variables. I think you know, in terms of a lot of our students are yeah. some sort of crisis at home as well. So I think it's a combination. The combination. I think our teams have gotten really good at identifying that, though, mm -hmm. and getting to the root of the problem where those academic. I think that's part of our lens when we look at that is, is, are these behaviors a result of struggling academically? And I think the teams are, are very good at recognizing that. I think what we're, from what I see on my end, we're talking about students coming in with much more significant mental health right. issues than we've ever seen in the past. And it's, it's, it's not just a secondary issue, it's uh, they're coming in very young ages with um, mental health uh, challenges and issues we just have not seen. One of the things we do is, as part of the RTI process, some of the students, we implement an FBA, and it's a functional behavioral assessment. So it targets when the behaviors are happening, why they're happening, um, and we, we try to see if, if we can see it. Is it a time of day? Is it um, a subject area? Is it related to attentional needs? Is it related to peer? interactions is it when there's a physical activity and they can't cooperate with others so we really try to get down and target what those areas are and then provide the support necessary to help them through that and those are the goals that we make with the teachers 
so that the teachers, the teaching assistants, all of our staff know, all right, this is what we need to do during this time of the day. And we see if it works, and is we there study any it. Resources to be able to do that? We make resource. We, we, we make time. Sure yeah. But is it? We do. The team takes a piece. Yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. takes a piece. Whether it's you know, Psychologist might do a little, social worker yeah. might do a little, classroom teacher might do a little. So we all work together and, and try to help each other out. How is the data? Who, who collects the data? Our psychologist collects it, but the data is collected by the different mm -hmm. staff member who takes like on those components. And we've become really good at it because we've got so many needs. So it, it's very it's a, interesting it's information. A team effort. And can I just say, I'm, yes. I'm very proud <laughs> of you in explaining what the, the function of a functional behavioral assessment. I mean, we've come a long way. We now have <laughs> really principles for teaching other people what an SBA is. That's just music and through my ears. I think all of our students have come no, a long way. Absolutely. She's absolutely right, though. We used to, all right, this kid's having really bad behavior problems. Let's, um, who can we call? Now it's, okay, we're going to do an FBA in a bit. Functional behavior analysis and a behavior intervention plan. Let's, find the cause let's get the data, let's do the root right, cause, support. and let's develop. Mm -hmm. So it's, we really, I think it's partially by necessity we, because we've had to adapt to the changing needs within our buildings, but um, we are much more confident in that way now. Because you've had success with this you know, kind of taking approach to this stuff, do you see, not to get algebraic, but do you see ELA as X, you know? RTI and math RTI is X, so the whole thing is 2X, or is there some synergy between these two where we can kind of do ELA and math RTI, where the two different disparate that you can't, you can't kind of blend uh, well, that, the I was delivery? Gonna, I wanted to, I was going to say, Jen, when you, when you talked about the, when we went west to look for the, you know, the pot of gold, we went yeah. to Penfield and yeah. we looked at their RTI structure and we came back and, and implemented that structure and, and I found it to be gold yes. <laughs> because it, it made it, it gave blocks of time for grades one through five that that's when the RTI staff can the, the services can happen and there's no new instruction from the classroom point of view the teachers there's no new instruction so there's there's um, <coughs> review and, and um, uh, center time or independent work happening um, in there a lot of tier one interventions and then the math AIS for three through five and K Five RTI can be pulled during that time. If we some special ed is pulled during that time, some OTPT. There's lots of different things happening during that time, which is great. So that that provided time for those things to happen. Before it was it was happening. You might pull during a social studies. You might pull during a science. You might pull during the 90 minute ELA block. Well, RTI is supposed to be in addition to, not replaced. You know, so <laughs> it was it was phenomenal for us to be able to actually do what Tim talked about, targeting the instruction to those kids. Um, and that's why I think our, it, it, it's a program that really now has time to work, uh, and, and it works uh, really well. So we do have, to the next part that you asked, we, we have our reading specialists. We have, um, some of them are providing the math AIS, but that means they're not providing the art, the, the ELA. So, you know, when you have this block of time, with the, and this, I'm so excited to be able to tell you all of this when I get to do my review in February, so I, we can get into it more. But. Um, my program review, but so there's this, you know, this block of time for third grade for RTI, there's this many, you know, specialists that we have, this many seats, and, and this, you know, that that's how only this person's doing math, so we can have this, that's where we get into, um, so we're, we're already using, utilizing our staff to the best that we can to be able to service the needs during that block and, and <coughs> for the kids, but it's challenging. It's challenging, and we still, I think, only speaking for myself. I think we still have a little ways to go. We have some grade level teams that work very well during that time with the remaining students that they have. And then we have some grade level teams that aren't there yet and could probably use some professional development mm -hmm. in how to take the students that are remaining to remediate, enrich, or reinforce during that time. Because that's a perfect opportunity when you go from a grade level of three teachers having 60 kids and now you're pulling out, maybe you're pulling out, uh, you know, uh, 10 for RTI, maybe uh, you're pulling out another 10 or 12 for um, primary enrichment, uh, and now you've got a smaller group of students that between the three of you, you could really do some mm -hmm. tier one mm -hmm. interventions with kids or enrichment with kids or reinforcement with kids. And that's the piece that I think we still we still have a ways to go, um, but we're getting there. 
it was clear by going out west and not finding the pot of gold. That was that was after you guys went out there. We went we went talk to the board, and said, so tell us all the, all the staffing you know, reductions. They're like, no, there are none. And so you know that you know, just that's just you know, so we just misunderstanding what the you know, what the long term play looks like. We got some education. About However, that. to back up Rick's point, you know, you're you're working smarter. Yeah, for sure. And and you're probably you know to Sharon's point, you're also having a a net gain result of kids. Right. maybe not being classified and kids may be doing better and having an opportunity to do some enrichment too. Uh, yeah, so we, we, you know, we across the board, if it's, if it's done right, I think your net gain, even though your staffing line remains flat or Chris you know, would say it might even pick up a little bit, um, your net gain is really <laughs> worth it. Right, if you, if you look at the investment versus the yes. student achievement gains, right. it's, it's, a, it's a great return. So it's just mm -hmm. not going to be a... Uh, the yes. so, right. yeah. yep. so before you guys move on, I just want to comment. Um, you know, they started off the presentation talking about the, the holistic approach to the whole kid. You know, just that's a place that our kid, our elementary school is a place that our students want to be, they feel connected, they feel cared for, they feel safe. You know, and then we moved into talking about the academics. Um, you know, and we talk a lot of technical things here, you know, looking at the RTI numbers and looking at all the screens that we do and the kinds of team approach we do to identify needs. I want to mention that you know we we see a brand new set of 200 to 225 kids come into our elementary schools every year. In addition, we registered 100 new students this year uh, alone, new students not counting kindergartners. So that's 325 new students to get assimilated into the system with all kinds of needs, and you know those are so that that kind of underscores why. As what Sharon was saying, you can have the best laid plans, and then you, when, you, when you're in a period of growth that we, you know, we, we see when we have 100 new students on top of, you know, uh, on top of our incoming classes, um, the, the needs are there. In the meantime, though, amidst all of this stuff, the results that these three buildings posted in, in, the, in the ELA math and the, and, and the ELA and math 3 3 exams were just extremely encouraging to us. I mean, they were at a place where you see what, you know, and again, we, we only compare because it's the only thing we have to figure out how we do year to year is how do we do with our neighbors because as the state changes the exam, you can't, it's hard to, they say right in the paper, you know, can't compare to last year, but you can compare to your, your peers and how we did. And, you know, all, when we combine the three buildings all together as a whole, our, our entire elementary population in the, in the ELA, if you look on page, we'll start on page six in the map, you know, no, they, they finished, they, they were the fifth highest cohort in third grade, the fourth graders were the third highest cohort, in, the, in this is in all the capital region, in all the suburban council schools, the fifth graders were the highest cohort, they scored the highest on level, that was percent of at level three and four in the capital region. Look also diagonally, uh, the, 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 the current fourth graders were the sixth and they were third in, in, the, in the, uh, the latest test. So the sixth highest cohort to the third highest cohort. In fourth grade, they went from the, they stayed at the top. They were the highest cohort last year. They were also the highest cohort in percent three and four this year. Then go on below to the ELA data, and you see across two, three, one. So we, our, our, our third graders were the second highest cohort in the capital region above, you know, the, the, all, the only one to outperform our, were the Bethlehem students. So the Skunas and the Shakers and the, and the Saratogas know that our grade three cohort was number two, our grade four cohort was number three, our grade five cohort was all, uh, number one in ELA as well as in, as in math. Also, you see. And look at the diagonals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's really cool. You can't part about that. And so, <laughs> you know, you know, so, sure, so sure, sure. while we're, they're not even focusing on that. I don't think you guys would have brought that up. If I mean, they're focusing on what do we need to do to get the kids that aren't being successful, and that's great. I mean, that's obviously what we want and what makes them effective. But when we look together, and in each of their buildings, there were areas that even within, when we kind of drilled down and looked, that that building had that particular cohort that was the highest in the district. So everyone kind of pitched together, and even though we might recognize more needs in one building than another, there's there's areas of real shining in, in, in all the buildings and it's just a, a really encouraging look <coughs> as the test becomes more I would say it's not that we're closer to doing well on the test but that the test is coming closer to what we really have believed all along is the way that we should be teaching math in ELA and so they're kind of merging back together and we're seeing success <coughs> and we have a plan for identifying students who aren't there and you know they're looking for some more resources to, to help in that math area for the kids again you know, we're getting more kids taking the test. 
You're more <laughs> taking the test, no that's, doubt. That's and, different. Yeah. and again, that's, that, that's yes. a seriousness of purpose <laughs> that's there. Um, but you know, that and that's low hanging fruit too. If we can continue to build trust in our parents that these tests are something worthwhile. Um, I got my my son's report last night. I wonder if it would be worth sending having people who didn't take the test just get those reports in the mail with just a bunch of blanks on it, you know, zeros. Because because it was helpful information. It was interesting and it was good to see. And then, you know, if you opted out, you don't get that information. You know, it doesn't help you. So. You know, Patrick, the, um, the, the, you know, those, you know, it's about data. Just, I, I'm more, I mean, impressed about the, our overall view at the, the, the kid, you know, as opposed to single data points. But the data is interesting. And, you know, we've talked a little bit here. The longitudinal looks at things are certainly helpful. Um, you know, I, the diagonals, Tim, you, you brought it up. That's mm -hmm. something I zeroed down right away when I read this. And, you know, listen, you know, you see blips up and down. Did we change a teacher? Did somebody retire? Who knows? You know, there's all kinds of answers. But the consistent growth, the thing that I thought was if you look, compare just one number, and I, it'd be interesting to see what other districts rate as far as reading skills. When you look at the ELA number, we're ranked one, right? That's with 20% students at grade five that are not at grade level in reading. If you look at that, that number, you know, and then they vary over the years here a little bit, but 20% of our students go into it, into that exam, not reading at grade level. Their, 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 their ability to succeed on that, not that that one test is the end all to be all, but on that thing, that's what's going to happen. You know, and I would be interesting, to, it would be really interesting to know, and I don't want to waste time on it, but, you know, I'd love to know in some of these other places, you know, what their reading levels look like. You know, what are we doing? It's, it's so great. You know what I mean? No, it's great. It's awesome. But you know why? I mean, right. you know, all of it is the story they just told us. Right. You know, and because when they're talking about focusing on that twenty percent. Yeah. You know, not saying, hey, we have seventy percent yeah. of the kids at you know at yeah. three and four. They're yeah. saying, what about the other thirty? And the other thing that I thought just was interesting in these in the in the, in the on page um, nine, if you look at the um, at the end of year numbers compared to the middle, right? You do your you do your test twice, and you see an old fifty plus percent improvement as far as students who are reading at grade level over those kindergarten grade, if I'm reading this right. Yes, um, Thank you. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's good to know. Um, you know, not, not in kindergarten, but in first grade and second grade. You know, third, yeah. And then they kind of even out there, the fifth grade is, a, I'll call it a blip, you know, as yeah, far as. Your, I would try to figure out, I talked to yeah. my reading specialist about it, we talked to the principals, fifth grade teachers, I, uh, it is a blip. But when, when you, we, go, we have a blip and yet, compared to our comparative <laughs> schools, you know, right. 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 <laughs> I mean, so that's, that's awesome. So it'll be interesting to watch as we continue, um, you know, and, and the results, I think, from what they do with the, at the younger ELA levels. It tells you right there what's going on. I, not that that's, that's just one data point, but yeah. again, it kind of tells you, John, you were asking what's the, there it is. It's right there. And then if you look at, there wasn't, I, I thought I, I might have lost my mind here on the math part, but <laughs> it's just possible. But there was there a math core? I thought there was like a, Maybe the trend at K12, maybe I'm, not, I'm reading wrong, sorry. I should have written it down. The other uh, thing that's interesting here is... Page 11? That's the math services. Oh, the services page, yeah. I got Maybe I don't remember. Anyway. If I was making okay. a business case for uh, math RTI, I might compare the fact that, you know, our, our results are similar in 4 and 5 between math and ELA, but our ELA is we're second and we're fifth in uh, math, so maybe, maybe one of the variables that contributes to that is the fact that we don't have RTI, and so you know we're, we're helping people later, and, and that's you know so it's a, there's a latent effect in the uh, on the math scores where we catch them up in fourth and fifth grade, we start behind in third. So theoretically, if we had more intervention kindergarten through second, maybe that would be on par with our RTI that we have for ELA. We've met this week. Thanks for the point, John. Just made Mr. McQuay's night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we can just stop charging, <laughs> we can just stop <laughs> charging those kids for those calculators, it'd be awesome. <laughs> Kate and, uh, and the pr elementary principals and Mary Ellen and I met this week to talk about um, some ideas to bring back just to continue to challenge the ELA committee. Which remember that this is all circular, you know, it goes from the ELA committee, which is a group of representative teachers, back to the building councils. Through through the principals and then back to the committee um, and just basically almost as if we I, I walked away from those meetings although they're really positive um, 
feeling like, wow, this is as if we didn't do well on these, and we did really well, and here we are looking at, we have meetings scheduled next week with Matt uh, for the middle school, for instance, because in the middle school there's preview of coming attractions, really good news from their scores as well, uh, but some areas. So we, we met to look at how can we continue to pr provide a unified uh, ELA curriculum and make sure that we give the teachers data that they need in their hands as teams to look at where how are we doing and how do we how can we improve I mean it, it's clear that you know our, our scores and again you know it's one measure but looking to say there's no reason why we can't be in a position where our scores are as high as any school in any grade level in across the capital region and that's not saying it to brag it's saying it to say we want the best possible situation preparation for middle school and high school for our kids and we do it in every other area, and we want to do it in ELA and math as well. One thing David said was was um, why, and he said, you know, he attributed to the holistic approach, and I think that, um, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, that if we didn't do well, we'd have task force, a task force form, we'd be doing all this uh, root cause analysis, what's going on, and so I think that um, it's great that we're talking about the um, the strengths of the program because I think that it's a motivator to, to ask why when you do well. I, like I'm going to be meeting with my teachers at their team meetings. Yes, we're going to focus on how can we get better this year, but also why were we number one in the region? Why were we so high uh, in terms of our results? What specifically do we do? Is it is it just the opt-outs? Is it perhaps the K the amazing K-12 structure we have behind us? Is it due to the fact that we do take a holistic approach? Is it because of our hiring practices that we're obsessed about hiring and that sometimes we reopen and reopen and reopen if we have to? I, I just think it, it's, it represents a great opportunity for us in the buildings to really ask why at a time when we did well because that whole notion of win early, win often, it's, it's, a, it's a motivator. It makes you want to do better moving forward. So I think we should jump on this right now early not linger with it because it is only one year and you want to look longitudinal but it does give us something i think to to you know to, to build on how do we determine how we're doing well so we can keep doing well right, right. So exactly we need to be we need to do root cause analysis of why we're doing well right. what, what were the factors that led us to perform that way so that we can replicate it as best as possible and build upon it so and, and, and the rest um, of the world may, may want to compare themselves to everybody on this page eventually becomes how do we how much you know we're number one but how much is the distance between number two and then that becomes our, our new metric right and so you, you know like with G used to be a real company and there was they were number one of the two and everything they'd say okay well we, we dominate the marketplace so how do we how do we destroy our business and re corporate mentality <laughs> how, do, you know, how do we reinvent that and, and, and redefine what success is because we, we, we can't get any more successful than we already are and so you know same thing here it's sort of like you know how do we keep you know, distancing ourselves and, and, and defining what that is and perfecting it i think it is the conversation we had earlier it's like it reminds me of kodak the the reason you know they they were not aware of the digital photography the onset of digital photography and because they weren't cognizant of that they didn't fare very well and so by us talking about the changing demographics perhaps the 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 increased um emotional and behavioral challenges of our kids why would it, is that is that real or is that just our perception mm -hmm. I think it's really looking at the sociological factors the economic factors in our community before they creep up on us and we're smacked in the face with it it's, it's asking these questions now because change is happening a lot even in this small community you can you can feel it but it, whether it be through surveys focus groups conversations like this I think get that going so that we're able to respond. Um, the other thing it. I think we've done well because it is changing. The last couple of years, as we've taken a look, building wide, at you know what grade levels are doing well, what what are some strategies that are being utilized in the different buildings that we work together with, and saying, all right, what are you doing? What are you doing? And sharing and right. making sure that we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important as well. We've talked a lot about the kids that are tested. How about how, what's the percentage of children who are not tested? So we have no data. Yeah. Uh, so we were down. down we were down quite a bit. We we went down. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but we were at twenty percent, and we were down to just around eleven, a little bit under eleven percent. 
So those so um, significant. Yes. And it went we were, the lowest we were in third at, and then fourth and then David right, hit the highest. We were at single digits in Stevens and double digits still in Charlton Heights and Pashley. So would you identify those students as your at risk students or would you identify them as the whole spectrum? No. The average yeah, yeah, opt out was more. Very bright, yeah. informed parents yeah. who have very bright, informed <laughs> students who politically or for whatever reason. Well, we, we saw a huge, yes. you know, again, preview of coming attractions. We offered an incentive to kids at the middle school to take the math <coughs> test as a pilot. It was very successful. We had um, um, almost, I mean, we had a, no last minute opt outs. It was only the people who really felt there were 17 opt outs, I think, in eighth grade. And they in were math, the second not high. Right. right. In, in math, math. In math. But math was the only place we offered the incentive. Right. And we and we had the second highest uh, math results in the capital region, second only to one school that had really stellar results. They were not, like, not 32%. 32%. And that doesn't include any of our advanced kids who don't take that <laughs> test. So we really, you know, so that was clearly. You know, getting people engaged. Everyone took the test seriously because they knew if they did well on it, they were going to not take the final exam. And you know, that was an incentive to the kids. And eighth grade kids are motivated by incentives like all of us. If you, if you diagonal the the active years, uh, you can see you know we got seven, eight, eight on, uh, on math and, and one five nine. I mean, we were dropping like a stone. So so opt outs were a direct correlation to our our, our failing performance. And then when folks opted back in or whatever they do when they stop opting out, uh, you know, you can see that you can see where it takes us. You know, it's it's, it's, a, it's a completely different direction. So it it, it has a meaningful impact. Uh, that's really part of the you know, story. Another thing to add to that too, I think the Common Core scale went away too. Of course, finally, but it's gone away. Right, different leadership, or a different tempo, and, you know, <laughs> more and more listening, you know, it, uh, appropriate adjustments to the testing. Two days instead of three. Yep. And if teachers believe more in it, I mean, it's not just the opt outs and who's opting out. It's that the te it's a seriousness of purpose about the exam. If, if it's just being put out on the desk as this is something we have to do, if people don't believe in the way the state rolled it out and all the craziness that went on in those years, you know, then nothing about it is as reliable, you know, as as if you as if you believe in it and you, you, you know, you're not teaching towards it, you're just taking it seriously as a measure of what we do. So I think better developed test. Better developed yeah. test teacher. Yeah. From here on out there are teacher design tests. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and a so. great test you David will be on that point of this one, but the, the science stuff that's rolling out so we'll get a chance to see, you know, that that should be a you know a much smoother discipline rollout. That we're going to, you know, get more. I think we're going to get a, a, one of these things on yeah, the program review on, on this. Science. Yes. yes. And so I think that'll be a good and they barometer. Have, you know, there are there are new standards across the board <coughs> um, in ELA, in math, in science, and in social studies. Yeah, we kept Dave. I'm sorry. Yes, he did. He's going to blow something up back here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was looking to see if you're awake, but Joe's head was kind of in the way, so I'm like, I was going to go for it. <laughs> There's lots of other data. I don't know if you guys want to highlight a couple or move into some of the other narratives towards the end. We've kind of, kind of jumped around your data. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, no, that's good. The other one was the of the buildings, but they're on that with the buckets. I think we're good there. Okay, Jill reviewed the challenges, and with challenge comes opportunity. So um, the opportunity section, I certainly won't go in depth into each. We've already covered a lot of them, but um, the first few bullets under um, the opportunities include just technology. Um, there, we're expanding technology integration as well as access <coughs> to technology, and that represent, represents an, a, an opportunity for our district. Um, our work on language arts with some, in this case, some external consultants. Our internal, our committees are doing a great job, but it represents an opportunity for us to continue to build up, build on the work that we've done with a couple external consultants who have really helped us um, hone our work in the, in the area of language arts. Um, a few other opportunities that we have present in our district um, have to do with just with the alignment of the next generation standards and the social studies framework and all the different areas. Um, that we have, again, an opportunity we have is our great K-12 curriculum structure allows us to really adapt to those new um, 
next generation standards that are coming our way. So we have a lot of exciting pilots being happening now so that when it, the, the time comes, we will have vetted different um, programs to help us be best prepared to, to meet those new standards. Um, keyboarding, you know, certainly you need to, we, we need to teach children to write because it's, you need to be able to write. However, in this day and age, we're, we're evolving more to the need for keyboarding. And so we're piloting that this year in our third grade, uh, at the third grade level. And that represents an opportunity for us. Um, because you, it's easy to cling to what we've always done since we were at school, and that is you do your handwriting. And we still are doing that, but not to the level and extent that we had been to provide more time to um, some keyboarding this year. When you say keyboarding, are you, are you keyboarding out of a Chromebook or are you keyboarding out of like a real keyboard? It's, they're, they're using the computers or the computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, also just in terms of um, the backpack program, the, the final one just has to do with, you know, the, the board stepped up and had that really great dinner and that helped contribute to this, this program, great. that for us as well. Just um, the team effort. So we have a lot of opportunities in our district. How much is the backpack for? I know it's usually not a huge amount, but it's, it's, it's significant. What is, what is the number of trees that on the backpack program? You know, ours. We do it the most, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, ours has been funded through a church. Ours has been funded through a church as well. Oh, so we have 25 families participating. Oh, good. Okay. Nice. Probably figure 10, 10 to $15 with food times 25 families in each building times every single Friday. Okay. You know, yeah, and, and they're impressive. And the, and the students and families aren't, aren't casual about it. Oh, you know, in terms of if we get it this week, it's okay. If we don't, it's okay. They really come to rely on it. It's true. I mean, to the point on a snow day, yeah, we delivered food. It's a big, it's a big well, deal. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Summary. 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 Uh, I'll do the summary. So, uh, what we are asking for you. To, to um, pay attention to in terms of supporting our programming and staffing and relate to the emotional academic behavior needs, which um, we feel that you have been doing, of course, and absolutely the consideration of the RTI mathematics um, specialist for early intervention. I said it a year ago, we wouldn't be starting it in third grade for reading. We really need to st start looking into this at the primary level for math. And um, continue to certainly recognize and support our staff and their commitment to our students' community. Our kids are the heartbeat of our community, and certainly our staff are just, um, they treat them as if they're their own, and we're very fortunate. And we love when you guys come and visit, so you. anytime you want to, come on in, and we'll show you around and <laughs> get in with the kids. Right? Yeah, you're welcome anytime. Anytime. In our so we're uninvited. Yes, yeah, so you don't have to be invited. Please come. And we, like, will you pass that on to your teachers? Absolutely. They already know. Already, you've already passed. Yeah. Oh, they do. Already you have an passed. open invitation. Just come on in. If I'm there, I'll, I'll tour you through the building. And we've done that. I, did Jen or John? Somebody came a, a year or two ago, and we just oh, we spent, send it out, and they, yeah. literally they'll see us in the hallway, and they're like, "Tell them to come anytime." Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. So it doesn't need to be those special events. Just really yeah, come. Yeah, please, anytime. Yeah. The uh, we talked about the first of all, the emotional behavioral needs. I know we have some of those. Great programs in your elementary working on. Is that filtered out of the elementary level or is that mostly secondary? No, that will be elementary too once we get our approval. We're still waiting. The, the Office of Mental Health approval process is daunting, I guess is the word. But I think, do you want to mention Tim Ferry's visitor so, this week? Of the New York News? Yes. Senator Tedesco will be joining us with a, for a PE activity, so we're pretty excited about that. New York moves to get us moving. Kim Ferry has endless energy, and it's going to be a lot of fun, 10.30, 11.30 on she, Thursday. She invited, she extended the invitation to others. She well. did, but she did. Nice. Is there stuff in the back that you, after the dating you want to touch on, or is it, I don't know. We wanted to open it up to you guys. If you had questions on, on any of the data. Well, that's where the science and the language enrichment are. The only uh, back person I've heard from yet is world languages. So I saw, you know, we've got two languages in the fall, two in the spring. I know we've been trying to penetrate a little bit earlier, earlier age. Is it, are we 
doing okay there? Or is there anything more we should be doing, do you think? We uh, have two uh, classes that just started up this week. So yes. we are offering those after school language pro programs again this year. And we're doing the same rotation. So we're doing French and Chinese in the fall. And we'll do German and Spanish in the spring. And we hope to, Mary Ellen and I had discussed this at ASL. We feel that there might be um, oh, an interest in that okay. as well. So. So out of, out of the roughly 1,300 elementary students, uh, how many might take advantage of the after-school language programs? Marilyn, do you remember the numbers? They were, they're, they compared to 1,300, they're well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think she had 29 and one, and mm -hmm. I want to say 24, and the, but um, Fairly even distribution about, right. in, so in French and Chinese. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's price-driven or busing? I think some of it is transportation. Right. Some other opportunities on other activities. You know, a lot of, yeah, exactly, kids are doing mm -hmm. lots of, yeah, they're doing oh, there's Legos just or they're doing drama. Or they're, uh, sports. Sports. Are there beyond, beyond, if the after school program, you know, touches 2% of our folks, are there, are there distance learning or online or other kind of programs we might be able to? I'm seeing one of the ways to introduce the other 98% to languages at the elementary level. Introduce them to the classroom. That would be great. Well, I'm not, not saying that literally. There's, you know, tons of data out there that suggests that yeah. introducing but a second language at a young age informs not only their knowledge of the second language but also their knowledge of their first right. language. It height, well, it and not only that, but it also heightens their ability to learn other disciplines yes. too. Cultural right. competencies. I mean, across the board. It's well, I mean, I mean, you know, the the, the I think. You know, Dr. Evans famously told me one time it's 19,000 yes. hours of uh, instruction we're trying to cram into 11,000 instructional hours. And so, <coughs> you know, the, 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 the competition with classroom space is tough, but, uh, you know, if there's a way to, you know, that's certainly a solution, but I'm not sure if it's a viable one, but, you know, there are other ways we can be, you know, in this day and age, I mean, with, with uh, what's the thing you can buy at the airports and learn a language? Oh, Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone. I mean, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of programs out there. That, you know, I'm not saying that's a program. But I'm, saying, I'm saying there's other ways people learn languages nowadays. I don't know. If, you know, the classroom maybe a maybe a luxury we can't afford or or, or do. But you know, yeah, maybe the one you know, of the questions, you know, alternate alternative methods of delivery, right? That's what you're getting at. You know, in, in times, you know, there's maybe Patrick. There's a way to, to ask that question through the consortium distance learning stuff. You know, to see where it, that's designed for high school, the program itself, but. The platform is there. Go ahead. Figure it out. Well, you know, I know Suzanne has already talked to the middle school folks about looking at the potential. There's a middle school out there that wants to share uh, Chinese with us. We we'll want well. to push down into seventh grade next year. Yeah, perfect. Chinese. Yeah, so, no, nice. Yeah. Have Chinese. Yeah. Suzanne, are there any models locally with uh, elementary instruction in foreign language or regular classroom times? Does anybody um, do that? Locally, no. Uh, I did a site visit to Glastonbury, Connecticut about three years ago. They have, I think, probably the foremost what's called FLESS, Foreign Language and Elementary School yeah, Program in the United States. And they offer at uh, grades K through three um, instruction that's woven into every classroom. So they basically do bilingual instruction starting from kindergarten on up. And then they weave in a second language at grade four, and they weave in a third language at, at middle school. Also, assuming if you drive north and cross the border, they also have a model for- uh, We, SISA. There you go. So it's the same kind of thing. You know, there's a- when, you know, the four school might be an option. Our, our younger students are supposed to be up and ready to go before everybody else, right? And maybe the four school program <coughs> maybe, maybe an option. might be easier for people on that um, yeah. conflict time. Maybe not for the staff, but maybe for the students. Mm -hmm. And for what it's worth on the uh, far as far as languages go, American Sign Language, looking at this learning network, is one of the most sought after mm -hmm. courses. If they can't. They can't get enough. They can't. Offer enough sections to keep everybody happy. So I'll just feel like that's worth it. My little uh, scenario is drama club. So we tried before school drama club rehearsals and after school drama club mm -hmm. rehearsals. You remember. <laughs> and the before school drama club rehearsals were more sparsely attended, and mm -hmm. when they did attend, they were a lot later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And a lot of times the kids and the parents would forget about it. Whereas we've got them after school, right. and then they stay after school, so it was 100% participation parents, after. Is that a function of the kids or the parents? <laughs> it could be either. <laughs> I think I know the answer. Yeah, I think I know the answer, too. Do you have the same issue with band, though? Well, the band is before school, isn't it? For all band is before school. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. No, Pete's not here. Pete's not here. Because that is a model that seems to be. I haven't had, we haven't had an issue of Ashley with that. So it's, it seems to be for that particular subject of the four schools. Mm -hmm. One thing we, we ended up yeah. talking quite a bit about social studies, or excuse me, um, ELA and math tonight, but just very briefly, I, they're at the very end of the presentation. Yeah. Just, just there's um, yeah. so just very briefly, but I, I, we would be remiss to not highlight them. Um, Dave, for instance, Collins has done so much to bring steam to the elementary level. He, he's he's himself has been there working side by side with teachers, delivered workshops, programs, and he, he's really done an incredible job of expanding the, the steam opportunities at the elementary level. Um, with Carrie. I remember when I was in the position, uh, Mary Ellen's position, um, we, we had a, a solid, we had a good, a good pace program. She's just taken it up 10, 10 more levels in terms of just the, the quality of the programming. I've seen it firsthand. I know the other principals have too. Um, not just the quality of it, but also expanding the opportunities um, with the board's commitment as well. So um, she's really taken it really far and we're so proud of what, what she's done. And the kids just love they to love go. It. They're so excited about it. One of the challenges we have with pace, not the challenge, one of the opportunities we have with pace was, was growing the program, right? We had some natural capacity issues, and then you were in great ways. Are we, are we sensing that also it wants to be in pace and, and that it should be in pace? Is in pace? So we have enrichment this year. So you heard last year the presentation on our primary enrichment, first and second grade. And I know I have um, hurricanes coming up, so I will be recruiting. <laughs> That's right. Um, so we've expanded to fourth and fifth grade this year. And um, what we did was we met with the classroom teachers. And scheduling-wise, we're trying to use the RTI blocks. So as we talked about earlier, when kids are going in different directions, some of them were coming with uh, Michaela Durant or myself. And we're trying to piggyback on things that are happening in the classroom, but obviously taking different twists on them. Um, so for example, um, our fourth graders right now are studying ciphers and how they were used in the American Revolution, how you would decipher, um, and then kind of tying that in with symbols and codes and things like that. Um, and then today was actually one of our kind of wrap-up units where we talked about all of the tools that they have gathered, the strategies on deciphering. How do you break a code? How do you figure out what actually the mathematical reasoning is on, is, are the letters shifted? Are there numbers? Is there, what's the rule? And we said, okay, well, do you use trial and error? Do you look at it in different directions? Do you find patterns? And we, we start talking about it. And I'm just the writer. They're discussing this with the <coughs> kids, and this was my like aha moment. You know, when you're a teacher and you're like, yes, they got it. My kids go, this is kind of like when we're in math class. I'm like, yes, exactly. <laughs> so you think we've been playing on decoding things? They went on a scavenger hunt and had to ask the nurse for band aids. They were asking markers in main office and paper clips, and they had to go all around the school once they had deciphered my uh, little scavenger hunt clues. But really what we're doing is getting them more comfortable with those problem solving strategies that they're then applying in all of these other subject areas. So it was a great lesson today to have a part um, of that aha light bulb going on. But the kids love it. You know, you have kids, and, and we said this to the teachers, that you have to kind of take your pace hat off. We want all kids. We want kids that um, didn't qualify for RTI, let us know that. We can weave in some of those skills that they may need more reinforcement with during our time. Give us those kids that are the ones that are always active and need to have some of that kind of down and dirty, like hands-on stuff. And I always go to Dave and say, all right, what's our next science experiment? Like, what can we do to, to tackle these kids and keep them busy? So I like tying in the things that the K-12s kind of are looking at for initiatives or things that they're trying to kind of model and show teachers that it's okay, we can do this. We can weave this into the curriculum. Um, so, so far, fourth and fifth grade, the kids love it. Um, and we've already gotten some really great feedback from, from parents. And uh, the, you know, the other piece really ties into the connections. You know, the kids want to be a part of this. Um, they do associate Michaela and I as being the PACE teachers, so they love coming and being part of that small, special group. And, uh, you know, I'm just excited to have 
the connection with them and build that confidence and that love of learning and, and then be able to send them back to the classroom with a greater understanding and, and as I call it, that toolbox of, of solving strategies. And Carrie, you find that all those that are identified as capable of participating PACE at a high level are able to, or like capacity-wise, are you, are, you are you having to turn anybody away, or do you have enough room to? Well, we always, you know, when we have, we have 30 seats okay. in fourth and fifth grade. So when we look at the kids and we look at the COGATs and we're looking at MPPs <coughs> and we're looking at, you know, I'm hoping we have some easy CBM data as well and the math chapter tests and so forth, you know, 30 seats fills up pretty quickly. And you'll hear too in the middle school, you know, 50 seats, two sections fills up very quickly, you know, especially when you have high performing cohorts of kids. Um, the enrichment piece gives these kids that maybe don't qualify for PACE, or even it's not a good fit. You know, PACE is not a good fit for everybody because um, they are missing class time, they are having to do makeup work. Uh, it gives them another opportunity to have some of this rigor, some of these high level experiences that the PACE kids experience as well. Yeah, so, six or seven percent, that's, that's a pretty reasonable <coughs> amount of accelerated, most eager learner kind of for cohort, I guess, right? I don't know how that compares to other programs, but that doesn't feel like a bad program. Well, I, I mean, you have, you have cohorts that. You know, just we talked just talked about the fifth grade scores last year. So kids that are continually performing at that level, we do get locked in with schedules when you go into middle school and high school, and the, the number of of available seats that you have um, in sections and so forth. So you, it, it's kind of that multi thing. You have FTEs, you have sections, you have high performing students, but you know, I, I think we. We juggle it pretty well. Um, I think we provide services, even if they're not in pace, that um, are, are rigorous and diverse and challenge the students as well. Um, I think we have a very strong pace and enrichment program, but I also think that we have a great staff um, and a great curriculum and, and great support to still challenge students, whether they're not they're sitting directly in a pace classroom. <coughs> And then I would say just in, an aside to that is, is the goal is to ultimately expand those enrichment opportunities to become a mode of primary instruction. So we want to model that for teachers. Ultimately, response to intervention is absolutely essential. Um, response to innovation is another way to look at it from a science and STEM perspective is when kids are excited about things at a young age, they hang on longer and longer because they're looking forward to what comes next. When they see at an early age coding and robotics and, and the application of science to reading and math, they are now really waiting for what opportunities come in middle school, what opportunities come in high school. With response to intervention, it's, it's great because we're, we're, we're keeping them in the game as long as possible so we don't lose them at the secondary level to dropping out or the other things as it gets more difficult, that gap widens. We keep that small so the kids stay engaged it's the same way with innovation. If they stay engaged longer, they get hooked on things, and then they're not going anywhere because they're just looking for the next thing that they can suck in at the next level. So yeah, um, you're, they you're know, still that low of learning, and you go to PLA and start to invest in the math RTI, and suddenly if you, students are becoming more capable sooner, and they're on a different trajectory, then how are we passing you know, passing through? How are we, how are we uh, yeah, passing in the, in the oh. later years so that right now there may only be 30 seats at the secondary level because there's only that many you know that are coming through the pipeline, right? But suddenly if you've, if you've got twice as many that are capable by fourth or fifth grade, does that mean we need twice as many you? Or does that mean we have some kind of blended learning or distance learning or other, other ways to, to build that capacity so that that pipeline you know funnels this way as opposed to funnels this way? Right. So I think I, I will say that um, the teachers, um, RTI, staff um, and even like <coughs> speech the last year and we've already started talking about it now where um, we keep talking about this RTI block when you have kids pulled in different directions how can you tap into multi-services um, you know Kathy Yando was awesome last year in Trotland Heights and saying let me come in and do the science experience experiments with you and let's do OTPT while we are doing the science enrichment with these students I learned a ton and it was something, I'm sorry, Kathy Kendall. Kathy Kendall, I'm sorry, yes, I apologize. 
um, Kathy Kindle, and I learned a ton that then when I was at Pashley and when I was at Stevens, I was able to apply some of the techniques that she had used while in class with me in the other areas. Um, we're trying to work, we have a, a, a couple of kids with speech services at Stevens, so we're trying to figure out how to pull in some of the speech services into enrichment. So it's kind of some PD for Michaela and I that we can then have and apply in other areas, but I think it's a great, it's modeling too. You know, you're showing kids that just because you're getting a service here, you can also get a service here, and, and the teachers are working together, and you're kind of blending that whole idea of, of education, learning, and you know, tweaking your skills. Good stuff. So just, just pull through the board for a second. Just format. Uh, okay. I've not seen learn. Any, any feedback on the format? And because you know, we're going to have two more of these, these guys are on the bleeding edge. But we got. Hey there. Yeah, uh, I thought it was great to get you know the full presentation ahead of time, so you had time to look through it, and then we had questions. I love it. I just um, sometimes sense like a little bit of hesitation in the asking because you guys are so amazing about giving. Um, and that, like, that's kind of the time to do that, to say, this is really kind of what our need is. I think we would all agree that we fully trust you guys and your opinions. And it may work and it may not work, but, um, I don't know, my personality is a little bit more of, like, not beating around the bush, but just, like, okay, the neon light, what do you need? <laughs> so that, that was all. I just was, wanted to be clear that I was exactly sure what you needed, but I just wanted to... Make sure I was. We were on the same page. <laughs> Do you feel good now that you know what the what the need is? Yeah, I guess I I, I still don't really know if it's um, like point five. Or well, that's like, good from budget season. Yeah. Yeah, like. There's a need so for like, addressing ads. Just a need. Yeah, but like, is like, is it? Do you need to like fifty percent more people? Like that that to me is still like a little bit of a gray area. Or like, what would get you into that comfort zone? I think we have to work with Patrick and Mary Ellen and Chris, see what the budget situation looks like. Well, you've had you've had budget alternates on this before. Yeah, I just be dusting it off, tweaking it, and, right. and updating it. Right. I have it. Well, I think we need about money. five more people, but to save the district money, we'll take it. Shake one of those. Way high. Seriously. Aim high. Yeah. 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 So, right. I think that's a good start. A point five. So do you think it would be helpful to have one RTI? Uh, representative for buildings, is that what you're saying? Well, for, I, for mathematics or ELA? For both. Well, ELA, we already, we already have three. Right, we have three. In each building, and we'll be talking to them. They're doing math. Like later on. Brian and they is are doing some math. math. Point so, four reading. Megan so, does but in addition to, to address the needs of the K primary K-1-2 students, you know, we'd have to take a look at um, numbers, mm -hmm. needs, before making any type of assumptions. I'd, I'd rather not make any type of assumptions right. until we took a look at real needs, got feedbacks from teachers um, to see what the needs are. We're going to be talking about budget goals in context of the discussion part of the budget tonight and we're going to be talking a little bit about a timeline and one of the things that happens is in the beginning of November we send out a letter to all the budget managers which include all, the, all mm -hmm. the principals and they will send back to us any budget alternates they have or budget ideas for the 1920 school year That'll be due back to us by December, and then in January we compile a lot of those different things and we give you as a board a big packet. We did it electronically. So that's kind of the system. That's when you'd see a lot of this stuff coming up. Um, that's our normal. I think it might be a good idea to let these guys chew on it before they give you an FTE yeah, number. Right. Right. You won't be surprised when you see. Yeah. Right. So, and I, can I just point out, like, I mean, just Tim just gave a great example of why I wanted to just make sure I complimented you guys before the end of this meeting, this presentation, because, you know, we have three great elementary schools. I see it from my side where people register all the time, I know they're coming here, and there's no school that is any more than any other. Like, people just, in, people, people want to be at each of our schools equally, that each school has this great character, uh, has a huge loyal fan base, the people, the parents love, they're led by these three, you know, by the work that they do to, in a modern day, with the kind of needs that face them, and then the challenges that are thrown at them. And then even in that, when Jen, you give them kind of an open 
you know, an open door to like, what do you want? You know, Tim, e e e and this would be the same answer you guys would give, I know, because Jill and I had this conversation this week. You know, they, they know when they need something, but they also have the, kind of like the maturity and wisdom to like be in that bigger picture as well. It's not just like they're there looking only for their building. Mm -hmm. They exist in the district. They know that when we give here, it, it takes from someplace else. I mean, the only way we do what we've done the last five years to keep our tax rates as low as possible and to be able to get the community to support things like the STEAM edition and hopefully potentially the project on, uh, on Tuesday is because they believe that that kind of thinking goes on. So it's, yeah, we need this. We also recognize it's going to come from someplace else. So it's that kind of mature thinking. Like, I, I know you guys make it look easy and, you know, it's not easy work and it's very, very complex balancing and I just appreciate what you do every day and what you provide for our Thank kids. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. It definitely sticks with people. John and Peter both introduced themselves to the CSE staff as passionate polar bears tonight. <laughs> 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 so, just wanted to make sure we brought that up. <laughs> so that did come thank out. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I'd like to also thank um, not only the principals right. but the K-12 supervisors because they contribute a lot of the data and the information that goes into the presentation. And Tara. And Tara, Tara Mitchell. Tara, Tara, Tara made it look awesome. Um, who yeah. took She's a incredible. doc. She took a Google Doc and, um, you know. It didn't look like this. It yeah. didn't look like that when we started, <laughs> and, but Tara certainly made it look um, we got very professional <laughs> and, and, and made some corrections, too, because we had a couple of little, oops, yeah. you know, because we wanted consistency. I didn't want decimal places in one column and whole numbers in another column, you know, with that. that Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't think the whole team Absolutely. and Tara as well. Yeah. And for all of them coming tonight yes, too. Thank you. A night out. Really and appreciate it. Which is this fun. This is cool. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm in. There's a lot more meeting tonight. So don't worry. <laughs> 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 I didn't have any catering. Hey, fun, 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 fun just started. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, really, really. No. The preparation for right. this was great. I know it's a, it's a lot of people, okay. you know, that, that do this, and, and we've been working on these for years. And, and this is one of the this is one of the richest uh, presentations I've seen in terms of the robustness of the conversation and the, the the value of the discussion. It was it was really terrific. So thank you for all the work that went into it. I know somewhere between back to school nights and opening days and everything else, you had some other things to do. But this uh, this was really worthwhile. So thank you thank for agreeing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just in 15 seconds or less, I'll feel it'll bother me if I don't. But a couple people. Um, we have new pianos. The, the, ENL, the ENL program with Suzanne, she spent tons of time at the elementary level developing our English as a new language program. And we didn't, that was in here, but we didn't touch on that tonight. 20, 20 people taking it or something. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. well, the, the English as a new language, the, our new language learners that are here in our district. She's done a lot to, to make them feel comfortable in our community. She spends personal time with them, and she's put a lot of time in. Also, we did um, Pichiru. And Joe Scalise have just done a lot. It, 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 it's a big part of our elementary program, our, our arts and our physical ed. So. Pizza yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we we can take a quick 90 second break, break to stretch our legs, grab some water, you know, <laughs>
Buffett is uh, watching us uh, remotely, I believe. Um, so we're ready to move on to action items, and our first one is personnel. Do we have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, I got Peter and I got uh, Jen. Uh, anything of note, uh, uh, Marilyn, on the professional side? Um, not really of note, but one thing that I did want to bring up because it, um, it's still in the middle of a posting. Uh, we spoke during the program review about um, good things that were happening. The uh, numbers for reading uh, were at were quite high at uh, Pashley, so we're going to address that need with a 0.5 RTI that will begin, I'm hoping, this coming Monday. Um, so you'll see that on the November 13th agenda. Um, yeah, the posting is just closing, so, but I wanted to, since we we're going to backdate the posting on November 13th, I wanted to bring it up tonight. Okay, thank you. I see we're building out the And again, first. it's addressed to address that kindergarten, the kindergarten first grade that okay. they saw this year in Pashley. Okay, thanks for acting quickly. So we're building out the boys' basketball coaching personnel, which is good. All right. Any uh, questions or just go? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Chris. Anything on? Uh, I'm actually gonna. I'd like Mary Ellen to speak to this because she can explain it better than I do. The only thing of note you'll see here is an increase in our transportation hours for the corporate sponsors that we have here at the high school. And Mary, would you mind just just for Lisa or anybody that may not be familiar with that? Tell so that our is. our corporate sponsors program is a, a long-standing program for students with disabilities where they. Uh, spend a half a day in the workplace um, in a non-paid uh, supervised work experience program with a job coach and so they are transported uh, to these different sites and so we obviously need drivers to do that the placements just get finalized um, pretty much now they're 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 going with those placements now so so it's an increase in hours or an increase in it's in, what happens is that these bus drivers have their normal bus routes to and from school. These corporate sponsorships happen during what we call midday runs. Okay. So the kids will be transported to school and then after that dropped off, they're then transported to wherever their various work location will be. And so the drivers obviously get paid for the hours to take them to these various places. And then they come okay. back here because it's typically a half day. And so that additional time is sponsored by a corporation? Or is that no, no, we just call the program corporate sponsors. <laughs> okay. Uh, but they do sponsor we the have, student. The corp because the we have local, yeah. we have local businesses right. that will work with students to provide them with job ready skills. Okay. So it's a. Okay. It's a Okay. We do this every year. Like this is every year. This right. is budget. This is just it. Just hits right now yeah. because the, now we know what we need, and so the drivers bid for the hours, and the drivers. And we have we have a lot of great. I should mention, we have a lot of great support, and always have from the community. Everyone from Gill's Garage to Fogs to sure. Price Chopper to um, you know all sorts of different placements where the kids can go and develop skills and have a job coach to support them on site. It's nothing so. new. I just wanted to make sure everyone understood. Thank you. That's, that's, that's all. Okay. Any questions or comments on personnel? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Uh, actually, item two, consideration of approval of revisions to P0100, non-discrimination and equal opportunity, P0110, non-discrimination on the basis of sex and handicap and education programs and activities, P2340, notice of meetings, P1400 public complaints, P4770 graduation requirement, P4772 graduation ceremonies, P2330 executive sessions, P4531 relationship between school and private tours, P5420 student health services, and P5500 student records. Do we have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, I think I got Peter and Lisa on that one. And uh, this is our policy cleanup. We talked about it at our last couple of meetings. We did it at our workshop. We had it in our discussions last uh, meeting. Any. Uh, any other comments or considerations? This is all the stuff we've already gone over. Yes, 100 percent final, gone over changes, 100%. and uh, gets us up to speed on all required um, required changes, and we're just starting to process the next batch. So the ones that came into our last workshop, right. <laughs> there's, there's a few more, but none of those are urgent. Great. Okay. okay. Um, any discussion? Questions? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstain. Moving on to action item number three, consideration of approval of special athletic competition request for varsity wrestling. Do we have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Was that Jen? Yeah. Jen and Don. Uh, do we have a, let's see, uh, any questions on this one? Uh, do we usually put, oh, okay, educational impact is right here. So there's a, 
So a fair amount of uh, time away, uh, but that's I guess these are restaurants. Teachers. Yeah. 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 Okay. Wow. Um, <laughs> any uh, any questions, concerns? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Next is the consideration of approval of financial institution. Do we have a motion, please? So. Okay, I heard John and Don again, and this is uh, I think Mr. Abdu. Uh, can you tell us a little about Just this? Just like I mentioned this at last week's, at the last meeting that we were looking into this, this is the same <coughs> almost exact wording that you use in the reorganizational meeting. We're just adding one other arrow to our quiver. Uh, Night class is a basically a municipal a group of municipalities that invest only, Night class is only investments that are allowed by New York State General Municipal Law. The current interest rate for this is over 2%. So again, as we're looking at interest rates improving, we want as many different financial institutions in our repertoire as available so we can hopefully move money to generate the best return on money that we have for a cash flow purpose. And we're, ha we're happy to do this now because this is the time of the year where the district is usually the most um, flush. I don't know if that's the right word, but yes, in a sense, we have the most cash on hand at this time of the year that we do at any point in time. So in particular now is when we want to maximize our interest income from that cash since we won't, hopefully won't use it all until later in the year. So, okay. Any questions or comments on this one? All right, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Moving on to action item number five, consideration of approval of recommendations from the Committee on Special Education. Do we have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, we got Don, we got Lisa. Um, any questions or comments? Good, because our special education person left. So, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, motion carries. Do we want to leave the cameras on to talk about budget, or do we want to not do that? That should be brief. I think you can leave it on. Okay. General. Okay, so we'll keep rolling, and uh, we're talking about the 2019 20 budget Sorry. as we're heading into that season. And uh, Chris has some uh, draft documents here about uh, kind of the uh, some of the overall arching things we do goals at the beginning around goals and content. Just so you know, Dave Versaki wants to listen to us in the car, so I'm about to turn him on on WebEx, so he will be listening. Okay. I think he's listening right now, except the microphone is still crossed out. He's listening to his CDs. Can you hear? <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you. You can hear me? All right. Uh, should I, can I mute my computer volume so we're not echoing? All right. I'm muting the computer. Dave can hear us. Oh, he hears you so, there? Well, he can hear me through... My computer. Oh, okay. We have multiple modalities going on for, this. for transmitting right. the board meeting. Nice. So, uh, what you're looking at, we've accelerated uh, this a little bit from where we did last year just because we wanted to make sure we kind of come back to a timeline we had a few years ago. Usually, this document has three parts you have the goals for the budget, the context for the budget, and then the budget calendar which is kind of a combination of the legal deadlines associated with the 2019-20 budget as well as a communications plan to engage our public in that budget process. So really, if you look at the top of this document, we're going to be asking the Board of Education, we have a long spell without a board meeting. We go from basically this time until November 13th without a board meeting. So one of the things we'll be asking you to approve is the goals and context, which is this document at the next board meeting on November 13th. And on December 13th, which is the board meeting after that, again, no, there's, there's one oh, there is one in between. Okay, so, and December 13th, just the calendar and the communications plan for that budget. The reason I'm asking you to look at this a little earlier this year is, as I mentioned earlier, we have the budget managers, we send out a memo to them, which basically has a lot of this context in there regarding uh, the, what we're looking at as far as budget development for the 1920 school year. And I thought it was proper and appropriate for the board to have this information just to talk about to see what our budget managers will be getting as we go through it. So there doesn't have to be a lot of specific discussion on this tonight. I guess if there's any questions, I'd like to answer them. And then if anybody wants to have any revisions or any suggestions for any changes here, we'd be happy to entertain them. So hopefully we can come back to November 13th with a, with a document that at least has these solidified so that our budget managers know that central administration and the board have these, is, these are our goals. This is our context as you begin to prepare your 2019-20 budget proposals. And Peter, the second one, was, is that consistent with what you were looking for? Uh, well, what I, I would suggest, um, I don't think we have the ability to ensure these things, although I think they're there. So I think, and more to the point of what we do is we promote opportunities so that BHBL graduates have the skills, knowledge, mm -hmm. and things that outline the district's 21st century framework. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I like that word. Promote opportunities that provide graduates with the skills, knowledge, or students with the skills, knowledge, and attitudes as outlined. 
promote promote opportunities that so, so provide that students so that the HBO graduates so the that. skills with the opportunity to attain the skills, knowledge, and attitudes as outlined. Promote, promote opportunities that provide students with the skills, knowledge, and attitudes as outlined in the district's 21st century framework for learning and so on. Does that work? We can maybe just skills out, skip, not the skills, just skills, knowledge, and attitudes as outlined. Okay. Or the skills and then get rid of that as outlined. Just put that, just so outlined. And relative to number three, you know, so in the next six months as we're developing this budget, do we have some specific plans to work with local municipalities and town and state representatives to do all the things that are in there? Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we do that. One of the things I know we're doing now, Patrick is on, we're, we're all on the visioning committee and we all try to attend as much as possible. I know Patrick's working actively on the sidewalk piece of this. Oh, um, yeah. The only that's question I have that we could potentially take out, you'll see office buildings. I think we've always said that appropriate strategic <coughs> commercial growth in the identified corridors where it's uh, beneficial for all residents of the town is something we'd like to do to increase our tax base and to hopefully therefore lower the, the uh, impact of the district's tax levy on our residents. Um, the third word in the IE, I don't know if you'd like to take that out or if that's something we want to leave. Well, more or less question, like you, you, you just outlined a number of things administration is going to do to accomplish number three. The, the, the statement starts with the Board of Education will work with the local media. So I mean, is there some board outreach that's supposed to be happening that we should be meeting um, with the um, town leaders or going to town board meetings? To, I think Somebody was suggesting that recently. I mean, this, to, yeah, this this might want to focus more on the lobbying side of things. I think this goal has typically been about lobbying, and last year we were, whether it was just after the sewers had, no, it was it was it was with leading up to the sewers, and maybe that was where this came from. This is last year's, you know, rent draft. So, you know, is this something we're more importantly wanted to just continue? To work with our representatives to make sure that we're well represented in the discussions about foundation aid. Now we can reward it, and I actually think I would recommend we do. What time? When did we meet with them last year? Was it around Novemberish? Mm -hmm. I I still think that was a good idea Senator. to go to their local offices yeah, and meet with them there. I think supposed Senator to Tedesco's been here three times this week. Counting yeah. well, when he gets actually was here Friday night. night, he was here last night. And then he's going to be here on Thursday. I just think it's a little more. It's more personal. And it's a little more effective than so lobby be. day. Where you're just cycling through, but right. we could reward it to say that if that's if that's more along the lines. Oh, we just take out everything because, in parentheses. Because because to. if you look at the oh sorry, please. Got it. I didn't do that. Not enumerated at all. Just. I mean, it's well, probably a good idea. Right. That we're not limited or bound by. But I think John's point is: Are we like we aren't really particularly not that we wouldn't welcome your participation, but we're working on behalf of the district. You know, we're your we're representatives to go to the town to be involved in this visioning committee, looking at yeah. the sidewalks, the pathways, the farmers markets, things that we've been working. Right. Does the board have an appetite to get involved in that, or do you want to talk here about? Or you could say the board of education will support administration's efforts to work with well, local municipalities. Well, but, but in the first paragraph of the context, it talks about I think specifically what the board should be doing which is attention must be given to lobbying efforts aimed at the governor and state legislature requesting the needs of the Vernon Falls and Lake community to be addressed by adopting reasonable increases in this area. And we were targeted, we were moved for some inexplicable reason to a, to a low priority district and, and our funding was impacted accordingly. Chris Ketsley ain't gonna fix that, <laughs> right? But but the disco might or Sir Mary Beth Walsh or one of these people might be able to, you know, th those are the folks we need to be, you know, so. It would seem like while the administration is focused on locally coordinating and, and, and that kind of okay, thing, that we're attacking at the state level and banging on doors and doing whatever, you know, and it's, it's consistent with our board goals that we're going to, you know, continue that new trajectory of lobbying that's been more effective. Right. You know, not that we're not going to participate necessarily in NISBA law, you know, day, but, but, but you know, off cycle yeah. going. So, so specific to them, then, Chris, what if you wrote something along the lines? So the first one is, remember, this is all about the budget. So working to balance the community's desire for Excellent programs, reasonable taxes. When, as you listen to the proposals, you're you're looking to provide opportunities to promote good education, right? Number two, number three, as you monitor the activities at the state level, you know, as a board, you will get involved as necessary to lobby uh, for the best, you know, interests of our health, something along those lines. So it's kind of going from the community. Number two is internally focused on the school programming itself, and then number three is as a board monitoring the state 
because this is focused just on the but the development of the budget, right? This is just this is just the budget. I think the. Uh, well, I think we can come back. We'll come back to the wording. I think we might as well. You've you got the gist of it, right? Yeah. We'll, just, we'll speak just send it, and send it out to us. Can... Absolutely. Well, we put a Friday notes if that's okay. Patrick, would you want it? We'll put it together. Yeah, I just want to take credit. We, we have no intention of going. In the context, I'd like to keep that for everybody. The attention must be given. Yep. I, I think it's because this, this is something that also goes to some of our the budget the budget stuff that we give to our budget managers. And there's others in this district besides from the board that need to use their respective organizations to also advocate for BHPL. So we want to keep that there too, I would think. But, and we may, in, by the way, the number one under context, that may be updated as we go through because by the end of this month we should start getting some guidance on TRS and some initial Medicare Advantage renewal rates. So we'll have, that may be updated as well when we get that, Patrick, well, well I, we might send, Patrick might send that to you in Friday notes too, just to make sure you have updated where we're looking at and how it's developing. The only thing I want to mention, and I don't see much traction for this at the state level, but I think I mentioned this one point before is number two. The tax cap was implemented, I believe, in the 2012 school year. 2012 school year up through last year, the, the nation has been in a, a, a historically low inflationary environment probably in, in, the, in the history of the Republic, it's, this is one of the lowest inflationary times we've had. And the tax cap had a verbiage that it was 2% or the rate of inflation, whichever is lower. One of the things we're looking at now is forecasts are starting to show that inflation is not gonna be below 2% from this point for the foreseeable future going forward. So that's one of the things I think we need to pay attention to is our tax levy may limit us to a 2% increase every year, but unlike previous years where that's been about where inflation's been, we're now going to see inflation outpacing what our tax levy growth is going to be allowed to be. And doesn't that sound like, again, something that we need to think about lobbying? Because we can't continue. You, you know, the majority of our costs are human, you know, it's our salaries and our benefits, and those are going to go up. It's, a, it's something that I, I think we have to maybe work with our folks at NISBA to decide what the most effective strategy would be. This one, not that I disagree with that, yeah. I think we'd be sw swimming upstream significantly yeah. to try to. It's like lobbying against Tyboro. It, it makes complete sense, but yet there's no. There's no way. There's no, you yeah. know. And it, it's even when we went to the NISBA conference, I forgot it was in Buffalo, the, the folks that do the lobbying for a living came right out and asked for more money, asking for mandate relief, asking for stuff for the tax cap to go. And it's just, you're not going to. You're not going to be able to get too much that. Yeah, so. Now, again, one other thing I want to say to pay attention to that I don't want to put in here because I don't want to make it a, a true political document, the state senate is up for grabs this year, and that's something we have to pay attention to. Um, it's not a political statement, yes or no, but generally speaking, when you look at state aid proposals, the Senate Republicans' proposal has generally been the one that's been most favorable to Burnt Hills over the past four, five, six years. The Senate... The Senate Republicans may lose control of the state Senate this year. There is no more, if I understand correctly, the Independent Democratic uh, Caucus <laughs> is, now, lose the primary. is now gone. <laughs> so there is there is no more IDC. So it's just going to be back to the Democrats and the Republicans. The IDC sometimes caucus with the Republicans. So if there is one-party rule in New York State after November, where you have the Democrats in control of the governorship, the Assembly, and the Senate, that may change the philosophy behind school aid. So that's something we just need to pay attention to to see how that may impact burn hills. So. And along the same lines, that just as an aside, if that happens and the governor, from what they've told us, like what um, Anita Murphy has told the superintendent, that the governor has the every intention of trying to push forward with the old APPR the, the way it was originally put in place. And there's been a lot of push to try to not do that. And you know, it's been on a hiatus right now, and that one of the things we were talking about getting past the Common Core and all the craziness of that, well, we could wind up right back in that same mess if they let this moratorium expire and we go back to the same rules where growth scores are being published and stuff. So there's a little bit of uncertainty about yeah. that, and uh, and it's, that's one area where Cuomo is definitely, uh, you know, not exactly on the same page as the Department New York State State Ed Department of Education. So that's. Uh, going to be interesting to watch. Robert Kennedy said there was an ancient Chinese curse, but you live in interesting times. So <laughs> that was not a blessing. I think we certainly will live in interesting times as this develops. So, 
number three um, is is accurate and perfect. We may want to just put a placeholder for about 168 hours from now because we, we, we can assume it's going to be another you know landslide and we can plug that in as another demonstration of the community support. Well, we, we are hopeful that <laughs> we certainly want to make sure the majority of our community comes out and votes and we certainly positive result would be wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it is positive. We would add it in there, obviously. If it was yes. not positive, we wouldn't bother putting it in there. But yes, I just yeah. yeah. If, if this thing Hillary Clintonizes, then we don't put it in. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, any other comments on uh, four and five? Are pretty just straightforward factual. Anything else? Okay. So we read the calendar. Uh, you probably got this the November 27th meeting, or maybe even a draft of it by the 30th. We'll just start to get to the calendar. It's really just, this is a public document that we want you to approve in December, so that it kind of maps out the whole budget plan. So it's really uh, kind of our way to get started. Yeah, it's, it's, not. It's, up, uh, it's up to us if we want to keep rolling for a few more minutes, because the reports of communication, we're talking about retreat part two in the Nisbah conference, but yeah, yeah, just shut it off. Yeah. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna sign Thanks, off. Dave, you want to stay on? <laughs> so, yeah, so thanks for...